Today's episode is brought to you by the Brandon Tennold Kaiju Critic T-shirt. It's the shirt that lets people know that you're a fan of monster movies and snarky Canadians who talk about them on the internet. And if you'd like this design in a hoodie, guess what? We've got those too. You can pick up yours today at teespring.com slash kaiju critic. Way before Kevin Smith convinced the world that anyone can make their own movie with a couple of bucks and some help from their friends, horror filmmakers were taking DIY filmmaking to whole new levels in search of success. Movies like Night of the Living Dead, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and Evil Dead all went on to become classics of the genre, with the grungy, low-budget look and style of these movies just adding to their appeal. But those are slick, big-budget blockbusters compared to the movie I'm about to talk about. Today's movie was made for so little money, it's one of the most homemade-looking films I've ever done on this show. That doesn't have the word Turkish in the title, that is. The Deadly Spawn is a 1983 monster movie that was supposedly made for just $25,000, which even in 1983 was not a lot of money. Just to give you a comparison, Evil Dead, another low-budget horror movie made around the same time, cost about $350,000. Hell, even The Room somehow managed to cost $6 million. I guess pictures of spoons are more expensive than you think. In some territories, the movie was titled Return of the Aliens in an attempt to sell the movie as a sequel to Ridley Scott's Alien. So I guess Italian movies aren't the only ones to have fake sequel titles. This has led some people to dismiss the movie as just a rip-off of Alien, but that's like calling Terror of Mechagodzilla a rip-off of King Kong just because that's what they called it in Italy. Instead, it's more of a throwback to the kinds of movies that helped inspire Alien, just with the kind of gore that probably would have caused the filmmakers to have to testify before Congress in the 50s. And there's no slow build-up for this movie. The very first scene is a meteor crashing into a matte painting. Let's go look. Hmm, a couple guys camping in an 80s horror film going to investigate a strange meteor? I'm sure these two will make it to the end of the movie. Oh, well, what do you know? I was wrong. Here's one way this movie's better than a lot of new low-budget horror movies. The blood isn't CGI. In fact, this makes it better than some new big-budget movies. Oh, hey, shadow puppets. Let's see, it's either a bunny rabbit or one of H.P. Lovecraft's pubic lice. I will say this, so far this movie's better than the 1997 Spawn. One of the producers on the movie was fantasy artist Tim Hildebrandt, best known for his Lord of the Rings work, which would explain how this movie got such an awesome poster. And how about that soundtrack? Boy, season two of Stranger Things got even darker than I thought it would. After the credits, we cut to a lovely dollhouse out in the country, and so far the most terrifying thing in the movie is this couple's wallpaper. While the film quality may indicate that this is a vintage porno, the best we get are some see-through mom nipples. And I'm beginning to think these people really do live in a dollhouse, since it looks like they got all their furniture from Barbie and Ken's garage sale. The husband goes downstairs to see if there's any water damage from a thunderstorm going on, and I don't know about monsters, but I'm pretty sure this basement has silverfish. <laughs> Oh, never mind. You've definitely got monsters. Great. Not only is this guy dead, but his wife's morning dump was so loud she didn't even hear him getting murdered. Sam. Sam? You know, even if there was no monster, she should still be afraid to go down here. I think John Wayne Gacy's crawl space was more inviting than this. And holy shit, the monster killed that paint can, too! What's going on is there's blood all over the place and you seem to be just ignoring it. And that's not the only scary thing down here. <gasps> oh, come on. 15 minutes in and we've already got a fake-out scare? <laughs> Wait, did this movie just do a fake fake-out scare? Alright, well, congratulations, movie. You got me. She gets attacked by something that looks like the world's angriest penis. And if you're wondering where most of that $25,000 went... 
Okay, again, that's actually a better effect than a lot of movies with several times the budget of this one. Eh, I don't like it when movies on this show impress me this early. It makes my job slightly harder than usual. Never mind that, though. We got more cast members and horrible wallpaper to get to. Our main character is a kid named Charles, and as you can see from all the posters and toys he has in his room, he's a big fan of monster movies. The mole people? Frankenstein. Uh... Mm, it, the terror from beyond space. Uh -huh. I'm not buying this for a second. How am I supposed to tell this is a kid's room in 1983 if it's not filled entirely with Star Wars stuff? The two people who just got killed are Charles' parents, but fortunately his aunt and uncle are staying over, so they can just adopt him right away. Oh, and there's also Charles' brother Pete, and once again, how am I supposed to tell this is a teenager's room in the 80s if it's not full of heavy metal posters? Listen, Pete, I appreciate you calling Batman to investigate your parents' murder, but could you put some pants on first? So after seeing the parents get brutally killed, where does the movie go from here? No one will be seated during the thrilling breakfast-making scene. They call the kids for breakfast, and it looks like the effects budget really took a nosedive. It, oh, <laughs> never mind, it's just Charles. No joke, this breakfast scene does go on for several minutes, but at least they talk about some important issues. Do you remember how the thing from Another World got killed? Yeah, I've seen the movie Creature, thank you very much. I don't know what the monster in the basement's doing right now, but this cat better hope it's not from the same planet as Alf. We also learn the uncle is a psychologist, and he decides to ask Charles some questions. There's going to be a um, discussion group of behaviorists in child psych, and I think your hobby would be very interesting. I mean, you're so into it. Yeah, I mean, a kid that's really into monster movies? You must have some serious issues. First of all, um, do you have any favorite monsters. You know, I find it a little ironic that he's asking questions about horror movies while wearing a Pamela Voorhees sweater, and I'm not sure about his line of questioning. Would you be willing to put on one of your monster costumes and scare me? Yeah, this is getting dangerously close to touchy uncle territory, so I think we're done here. And has this guy been prescribing himself medication? You just got done eating breakfast, why are you falling asleep already? Ah, looks like the next victim just got here. Remember, the circuit breaker's in the southwest corner right next to the dick monster. Meanwhile, Charles decides to go down to the basement and scare the electrician while cosplaying as his favorite monster, Vampire Dr. Zaius. Let's see, on the one hand he is a kid, which would normally mean he's safe, but this is also an 80s movie, which means he still might die. One difference between Charles and his mother is he actually sees all the blood, but apparently just doesn't give a shit. Plus, it looks like they really do have silverfish, among other problems. Yes, Charles, that's a hand you just saw on the ground. Good job. Seriously, kid, do you mind coming back a little later? James Gunn still needs to finish filming Slither. First, though, there's something you should know. Now there's the look of a kid who's slightly upset that his mom's dead. Meanwhile, some of Pete's friends come over because, hey, this movie's body count isn't going to increase itself. And they've got something important to show him. Is that alive? No. What the hell is it? I don't know what that is, but I'm pretty sure it ends up becoming the monster from the host. And you probably shouldn't touch something that looks like a dildo that can bite you. You know, I just realized, we haven't had any filler in a while. If it is a vertebrate... These bumps suggest the order of a podium. With those teeth, it could almost be a fish. Or it could be a misshapen lamprey. Like, that reminds me of coelacanth. Ooh, what? Yeah, coelacanth. Uh. No one will be seated during the thrilling biology discussion scene. Looks like Charles is still in the basement, and I don't think I like this kid's attitude. The filmmakers worked really hard on these effects, and he doesn't look impressed by any of them. Come on, Charles, you've got King Ghidra's dick with herpes in your basement. Would it kill you to react in some way? Okay, I joke, but honestly, the monster in this movie is way more memorable and creative than it has any right to be. 
Considering how low the budget was, they could have easily just had the monster be some guy in a costume, which is what a lot of movies with bigger budgets than this movie did, but instead, they went the extra mile and actually made something truly weird and alien looking. And let's face it, if you went down to your basement and saw a giant alien penis monster that could bite your head off waiting there, you'd be fucking terrified. Well, unless you're this kid, apparently. Pete's friends decide to dissect the creature they found, and I think I figured it out. This movie's really about Farmer Vincent's early years. It really does take all kinds of critters to make his fritters. Speaking of food, another plot point involves the ant going to her mother's house for a vegetarian brunch. What shall I do? Oh, I'll start you with the green sauce. These are the green sauce. Hmm, a vegetarian meal in a monster movie? I think I know where this is going. I must do it! I must do it! and you can't piss on hospitality. I won't allow it! While we're on the subject, Troll 2 was another low-budget horror movie, but instead of penises, the monsters in that movie just looked like ass. So again, my compliments to the effects crew on this movie. Pete's friend Frankie thinks the creature they found may have come from outer space, but Pete doesn't seem to believe his theory. You always know everything. Why couldn't something come from outer space anyway? Because it's impossible, that's why. Scientifically impossible. That's right, it's scientifically impossible because outer space isn't real. It's a lie made up by the government to distract the public from the fact that JFK invented time travel just so he could stage Sandy Hook. Although, Pete may be right not to listen to Frankie. I vote we show it to your uncle and ask him what he thinks. Yeah, he's a psychologist. He should know all about biology. First, though, we need to get to Pete's budding romance with his friend Ellen, because I guess that's a thing. Are you and Frankie going together or not? Well, we're going to the movies with you tonight. You know what I mean. So you're not going with him. No. You want to go with me? Look, we had to get this movie's runtime to 80 minutes somehow. Just let him flirt for a couple minutes. Maybe there's more happening at the vegetarian dinner party. I've never seen this giraffe before. He's new. He's big. Don't you just love him? To pieces. Please tell me they die soon. And there's more inane conversation where that came from. Did you know he's a vegetarian? Who is? The gorilla. No eating of flesh for him, no sir. Oh yeah? Well tell that to King Kong. The guests arrive at the same time as some of the monsters, and if accidentally chopping one of them up and putting it in the salad doesn't put a damper on this little vegan shindig, then this sure as hell will. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. You ladies may not eat meat, but meat doesn't give a fuck if it eats you. Meanwhile, Charles is still down in the basement, and if he stays down there much longer, he is going to be dangerously close to actually reacting in some way. And wasn't Pete going to ask his uncle about the creature? <laughs> Kids, if it makes you feel any better, your uncle was on so much Xanax that he probably didn't feel a thing. I'm also not sure how the big one suddenly managed to get upstairs, since I don't think this thing can fit through doorways. Thankfully, Charles has a foolproof plan to distract the monster. Hey, come on, I like that song. And listen, movie, I know I've been comparing the monsters to penises the whole video, but I think you might be taking that a little too far. There is a child present. Pete and his friends managed to escape to Charlie's room, and hey, just because we're an hour in doesn't mean we can't introduce another new character. Hi! Hi! Who the hell are you? This is Kathy, another one of Pete's friends, and while she may be a little late to this movie, she makes up for it with enthusiasm. What? Now there's an appropriate reaction. Remember, the important thing is to save the posters. Your lives are expendable. They make a break for it to go to Pete's room because... I don't know, maybe they like his space posters better? Unfortunately, Ellen doesn't make it. <laughs> eh, I'm sure she's fine. Okay, there's a window. Now for the love of God, jump out of it and get the hell out of there. You might sprain your ankle, but I'm pretty sure that's better than getting your head bitten off. Well, at least Pete managed to make it outside, which means he can go get some help. <laughs> or not. They never left. Car's still sitting there. 
Which is pretty funny when you think about it. Pete seems to have snapped, although I think it's less because so many people have been killed and more because he knows he's definitely not gonna get laid now. But Pete, will you shut up? You make me sick! What are you always babbling about? Look, Pete, I appreciate the effort, but you are never gonna top this line delivery. What the fuck was that? <laughs> Oh shit, looks like the monster's breaking in. If only there was a window they could escape out of. Meanwhile, Charles is doing the smart thing, grabbing his movie memorabilia and getting the hell out of there. Okay, actually he rigs one of his prop heads with an electrical cable and gets the big monster to swallow it in order to try and electrocute it. But there's one thing he didn't count on. <laughs> Aha! See? I told you being in an 80s movie meant you weren't guaranteed to live. Actually, he does end up surviving. Although in this movie, that might actually count as a surprising twist. Okay, time to take care of this thing. Hmm, bad grounding. The monster's one weakness. So with the main monster defeated, the authorities throw it on a bonfire along with Ben's body. Now that people are aware of the alien threat, they seem to be doing a good job taking care of them. Sadly, they were too late to save Aunt Millie's Seinfeld puffy shirt. Hmm, I don't know. This ending seems a little too neat and tidy for a movie like this. I sense a twist coming on. K24! K24! Come in, K24! <laughs> oh shit, it spawns Zilla! Okay, that may look bad, but remember, this is actually happening on a model train set. That thing's only about as big as one of the small ones. Despite just narrowly missing out on getting a theatrical release from Paramount Pictures, the Deadly Spawn still managed to be a moderate success, and while it's not an all-time horror classic like some of the movies I mentioned at the beginning, it's still a pretty solid example of grassroots filmmaking, even if it does have some pretty big flaws. Yeah, a lot of the acting's pretty shaky, yeah, there's a good amount of filler, but the effects and gore scenes are remarkably well done for such a low-budget movie, and there's a real imagination to the alien creature that you don't often see even in movies that cost several times what this did. It somehow manages to be both amateurish and impressive at the same time, which just adds to its charm. If you look at the movie's poster, it's obvious the filmmakers wanted to make a simple, schlocky monster movie like the old-school ones that Charles is into, just with all the gore and creature effects audiences in the 80s expected. The movie also managed to get a sequel called Metamorphosis the Alien Factor... well, sort of. Despite being filmed as The Deadly Spawn 2, the final movie ended up having almost nothing to do with the first one, resulting in the title change, although in some parts of the world it was still released as The Deadly Spawn 2. I guess it's appropriate that a movie marketed as an unofficial sequel to Alien would end up getting its own unofficial sequel. But if nothing else, this movie shows people that with a little bit of money and a lot of hard work, you too can make your own monster movie. Or, you know, you could just talk about them on the internet, whichever you feel like. Well, that's all for now. Until next time.